I will turn it over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, and welcome. Welcome to you all. I'm very flattered that so many people from around the world have have joined in. It's, uh, it's like doing an orbit for me, being back in space again. Um, so I will share my screen if I'm, if I can do that. And start there. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today a little bit is the history of human spaceflight as the, uh, as the title said. Um, and the, the one thing I want you to realize is that every picture I'm going to show you, every single one, was taken by a human being, uh, including this one, this picture of the Earth, which is a very famous picture. Probably the most reproduced picture in all of NASA's photographs was taken by an Apollo astronaut at the moon. And so here's how we got there. The first human to fly in space, of course, was the Russian Yuri Gagarin. Uh, in the United States, here was our first astronaut. Um, really, these were the first seven Mercury astronauts that flew. And in the United States, they flew on this Mercury capsule, which you can see by the size of the people is fairly small. And we put that capsule on top of what was essentially a ballistic missile at the time and sent them into space. This was in 1961. Uh, this is John Glenn, who was the first American astronaut to actually orbit the Earth. All of those mercury capsules were thrown into the water after landing, and then the astronaut was brought back to land in a helicopter. The next program we flew was Gemini. It was a bigger rocket. It was a bigger capsule. It carried two crew members and allowed us to learn a couple other skills that we would need in space. One was how to join two spacecraft together, traveling at 28,000 kilometers per hour, and the other was how to do a spacewalk. Here in the early days of spacewalking, all of the air and the pressure and the oxygen that he needs uh, comes to him in this umbilical line that is connected to the spacecraft. So he is connected that way in order to, to keep him alive. Here's how much room there was in the Gemini capsule. You can see there's not very much room. The longest flight in the Gemini days was 14 days. So imagine living like that for 14 days. In uh, 1968, we flew the first Saturn V rocket with a crew and we sent them around the moon, not to land, but to go around the moon. And it was the first time ever that a human being has seen the earth rise and set from another, from another planetary body. In 1969, we put our first crew to land on the moon on that Saturn V rocket and, and off they went. There were three people, three crew members in that rocket, one st in the capsule, one stayed in the capsule while it orbited the moon and the other two went to the surface of the moon in this lunar lander. And remember all of these are real pictures. That first landing on the moon, and here you can see the astronaut and the size of his spacecraft, this portion up here, the top part, is the only part that will leave the moon again. In fact, it was so small, there were no seats. The astronauts had to stand uh, in that little uh, part of the vehicle. And that first landing on the moon, they spent all of 21 hours on the moon and they walked as far as 250 meters. That was it. And the fact that they did that changed the whole way the world looks at itself. We had five more flights uh, that went to the moon, so 10 more American astronauts walked on the moon and those flights were longer, they stayed longer and they had a little rover that would let them go um, a number of kilometers away from the spacecraft, but they could only go as far as they could walk back um, if something happened to that rover and they only had eight hours of oxygen in the suit. So again, we have not explored very much of the moon. Here's that top portion of the landed vehicle I showed you coming back off the moon to to attach to the Apollo capsule, and then they would come back to Earth and land under a parachute. And you can see how burned the capsule looks from having come through the atmosphere. Although the Russians didn't get to the moon, they have been successfully flying in space since 1961. And today they fly on this rocket called Soyuz, this capsule called Soyuz. And uh, up until very recently, this is how American astronauts got into space so that uh, astronauts, cosmonauts, are in this section here, the solar array and the engine, 
and this, the uh, cargo vehicle part is there, and those two pieces don't come back to Earth. Here's what it looks like inside that Soyuz uh, capsule. So they, again, they also have three people in there and, and not very much room. And they land under a parachute. And this, this uh, video, this is a normal landing of the Soyuz capsule. So that's what they call a good landing, a normal landing. Just to show you the way spacecraft are landing here on Earth in, in the year 2020. Um, this is how the crew is recovered in the era of COVID. Um, the crew is taken out when they land in Kazakhstan and, and uh, now everybody gets to wear a mask so that they don't infect the crew. But this was a landing that happened probably in April of this year. And that Soyuz capsule is also burned from having come through the atmosphere. So all of these spacecraft from the very beginning, from 1961 on, were designed to be used just one time and then not used again. <clears throat> in 1981, we started flying the space shuttle, and this was a spacecraft that was designed to be reused. The way we got into that shuttle with a suit that we wore in this um, started with uh, a series of long underwear, which is underneath of this white stuff, and a nappy, a diaper that we're wearing underneath here. And then this white part, all these little squiggly lines you see are tubes that water can flow through to keep you cool. And then on top of that goes this big orange suit. You may think that the job of an astronaut is very glamorous, but I show you this to tell you that this is the last view anybody sees of you before you get into the vehicle to fly. Here's what we look like strapped into that uh, space shuttle. This is me actually on one of my flights. <clears throat> now the space shuttle, remember, flew in 1981 for the first time. And it was designed, like I said, to be reusable. So the whole spacecraft is reusable. The engines are reusable. And these solid rocket motors, which burned out after two and a half minutes, were also reusable. So they came back to Earth under a parachute and then were picked up by a boat, brought back to shore, and then repacked with a propellant and used again. The only part that was not reusable was the orange tank, which held the liquid oxygen and hydrogen which was the fuel for those three main engines. So the shuttle, once it got to orbit, flew like any other of the spacecraft in orbit. And then it came back to land like a normal airplane, only with no engines. So it's a big glider landing on a normal runway. And if it did not land back in Florida, where the launch site was, then it was put on top of the 747 and flown back to Florida for the next mission. We did a number of things in the early days of the space shuttle flying, including putting a number of different satellites in orbit, things that were carried in the cargo bay in the back of the shuttle, and then either deployed um, with a spring or by picked up with a robot arm and put into space. And probably the most famous of those that people hear about is the Hubble telescope. This was carried in the cargo bay, picked up by the robot arm, put into space, and then over the period of years was revisited by the shuttle that would fly up to it, pick it up with the arm, stick it in the cargo bay, and then the crew would go outside to do maintenance on it. And when they talk about replacing parts of the Hubble telescope, they're talking about this is an electronic unit, and they literally opened the telescope and went inside to do the repairs that they needed to do. And then the arm would pick it up and stick it back outside the cargo bay and the shuttle would back away. And so the Hubble is still flying today. Starting in about the year 2000, we used the space shuttle for the next 10 years and 35 some flights to assemble the International Space Station. So each portion of the space station was carried in the cargo bay of the shuttle. The first American part we put was this node and we attached that to the first Russian part. So here is that piece that's connected and now we can stick another part all around the side and on, on the end of it here. So we, were, we brought up parts one at a time. So here we've added to that node and that Russian module, another Russian module, there's the Soyuz. So there is a crew on board, a solar array. And that's the way it looked on my last flight in 2001 when we arrived. And then we left this laboratory module. And then over the years, we added more solar arrays, robot arms, um, a truss so that we could move the solar arrays out. 
um, additional solar arrays. Here's a real picture of the shuttle docked attached to the International Space Station, which I think is pretty cool. Um, we've added modules from the European Space Agency, from the Japanese Space Agency. Uh, the Russian Space Agency has added some additional modules. And today, this is the way the, the space station looks. And there has always been a crew on board staying for either three months or six months or a year since the end of the year 2000. This is the crew that is currently on board now. We have uh, three Americans. These are the two guys that just arrived in the Dragon SpaceX vehicle and two Russians. So here's the way it looks to be in space when there is no gravity. So that's me. And just if you were wondering how that picture was taken, here it is. The thing about being without gravity is there is no up. Each one of these guys thinks they are up. And apparently without gravity, there is no fashion sense either. Without gravity, you can lift many heavy objects by yourself. And if you ever felt like you should do a Cirque du Soleil kind of thing, you can do that without any gravity also. And you cannot walk when you're in gravity, you have to fly. So I apologize for the creaking music that's happening in here. This is actually really the way you move. Notice where, what his feet are doing. You can do some really interesting things with your body when you float. It's me with a camera back there. And some interesting science experiments. Here he's getting hit with a 95 pound bag of water. So force and reactive force. This is me and I'm not moving from, from one place to another, but just by twisting my body, I can turn completely around. This is the example of, a, uh, of the ice skater. So as he spins, when he opens his arms, he slows down. And when he closes his arms, he spins back up again, opens his arms, slows down. And you can spin all day long without any gravity, and you never get dizzy. Here's another one. We ask you, please, do not try this at home. This is sort of conservation of angular momentum. Now he's trying to do that same thing that I was doing, but guys, guys can never really get that hip action going correctly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now you've seen people floating around. What if you want to stay in one place and do some work without floating away? And, and it takes very little pressure just to touch and you would float away from something. So all around the space station, there are these loops that you can slide your toe underneath of. And now you can hold yourself with your feet while you work at your workstation. Or you can just loop your toe around something if you wanted to. This is a ball of water. And in the absence of gravity, surface tensions, the strongest force there, holds the ball of water together. This is a ball of orange juice, which is a little bit more photogenic. And here's a video of a guy making a really, really big ball of water. Because you know, he's a guy. So he's squeezing water through that straw out of a bag. Now they're, they're using two bags. You can see all the little balls of water floating away from it. Now he's taken a GoPro camera and he's thrown it on the inside so it sticks by surface tension and turn it on because you know, he's a guy. If you ever wondered what it looked like inside the ball of water looking out, here, here it is. Now the reason I really show you this video is for this next part, see the water on his hands, see the way the water sticks to his hands like that by surface tension. All right, well, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Normally the way you drink um, is by putting water into a bag that has a powder in it and there's a label on it. So this would be orange juice. So you take that bag and you stick it in the water dispenser to add water. Sometimes the guys like to drink directly from the water dispenser. Um, and then you put in your straw and you drink. So here he's got his drink bag and all the rest of the food 
is already prepared. So we have no oven and we have no refrigerator. So the food has been already cooked and then freeze dried or vacuum packed and put into these packages. So here, in order to rehydrate that, you put that package, oh, well, here's, we have all kinds of food, um, meats and vegetables, here's creamed spinach, here is corn flakes. So you put that package in the hydration system here, and then you can have hot water or ambient water, and you can dial in the amount of water that you need, and it fills that up. And then there is a little oven that just warms up the food because it's already been cooked. You do not eat with a plate and a knife and a fork. You basically eat with a spoon. So you take these long spoons and you dig them into the food and eat it. And here in the back, you can see that these, these uh, plastic bottles here hold the liquid salt and liquid pepper spices that you need because you wouldn't want salt and pepper floating, floating around. The Americans provide half the food. The Russians provide half the food. This is what the Russian food looks like. And here is the table set with all kinds of food. There are some of those high uh, packages, the Russian foods. And then we send up tubes of things like anchovy paste and garlic paste and, and dried fruits and things like that. You want food in space that has no crumbs. And so here's sort of the perfect space food, peanut butter and honey, or here's peanut butter and jelly on a tortilla. Here's a piece of meat. When the meat has been cooked and put in this package, this is a thermostabilized package, so it does not have to be refrigerated. You warm it up, you cut off the top, and then you sort of squeeze the bottom like you were eating um, sort of a popsicle or an ice cream thing, and you just chew, you just eat, chew the top, and then squeeze up a little bit more. Here's a dispenser of salt. The crew on board uh, does not have the opportunity often to have fresh food. There are cargo vehicles that bring supplies to the space station every three or four months. And when they do, they bring fresh fruit and fresh vegetables. And the crew is always thrilled. Imagine if you hadn't seen a piece of fresh fruit for three or four months. You might want to just enjoy the smell of it before you eat it. And when the cargo vehicle comes with fresh fruit and fresh vegetables, then you can get very creative in how you combine all of your foods together. Here's how you eat your M&Ms. There goes the spinach. See, nobody wants that. Here's the chicken. the best stuff. Here's the M&Ms. Here is the NASA High Tech Trash Compactor. If you think about it, here on Earth, we take our trash out and somebody collects it once or twice a week. And in, on, in space, no one collects the trash. We don't throw the trash outside. So we collect it in a bag and we compress the bag as best we can. And then those bags sit on board the space station waiting for the cargo vehicle. When the cargo vehicle shows up, you take all the good cargo out and then you fill it up with all the trash that you have been collecting for two or three months, which includes your food trash. Exercise is important. Um, your body, the muscles of your body could become weak without having to use them in gravity and you're fine when you're in space. But now when you come back to earth and gravity is on you again, you could, you could hurt yourself. And so the crew on board the space station exercises two hours every day. One way is with this bicycle ergometer. He's strapped in, he's holding on to these uh, bars here. And then the shoes are clipped into a pedal and uh, he can pedal against a resistance. Or we have a treadmill bolted to the floor. She's got a harness that holds her down to the treadmill. And as the tread run uh, moves, she can run on it. Or this device allows you to do resistive exercise. So he's again strapped onto it. But as he pushes up, he has put a resistance in that bar. So that he can exercise against a resistance. And you can do any exercise that you can do in a gym on that machine. Recreation time, the crew actually has a big screen TV. Looks like they're watching Top Gun here. So you can see they're all collected with their, with their drinks and their snacks so that they can have movie night. We have some instruments on board. Guitars are easy. He's playing a, a, a flute and some pipes. And he is actually playing drums on a, um, a collection for waste from the from the toilet. Here's how you take a bath. Remember the ball of water on the hands that I showed you? Well, you put that ball of water on you 
and you rub it around and then you take some liquid soap and soap yourself with a washcloth and then another ball of water to wipe that off with a towel. So you bathe yourself sort of one body section at a time. Shaving is normal. We have electric razors, we have straight razors. Um, sometimes a crew when they spend significant time on orbit would like a haircut. And so how do you cut hair when it would float around? So he's cutting hair and it's getting sucked into this tube into a vacuum cleaner, a special device made just for hair cutting. Not everybody cuts their hair. Here is toothpaste. It's normal, you have toothpaste and a toothbrush, you brush your teeth, but there is no place to spit. So they suggest that you swallow the toothpaste. Here's how you sleep. You take your sleeping bag, on the shuttle we took our sleeping bag and we would hang it on the wall or the floor, the ceiling, wherever we wanted to sleep that night. And you get in, you strap yourself in, zip it up, and whatever you don't strap in will float. But because there is no gravity, your hands don't fall asleep, they just sort of float out there in front of you. These straps here are Velcro and you strap them to you and it makes you feel like you're tucked in. And then you put your head on the pillow, which is a block of foam, and you strap your forehead to it. And if you think about it, when you go to sleep at night and your head is on the bed and you rest, your neck is at rest. And when your neck is at rest, you are at rest and you can go to sleep. On board the space station, each crew member has their own little compartment to sleep in. So she's got her own sleeping bag in her own little compartment and her drink bags and her checklist and all of her personal items are in there. Here is the toilet. This is a Russian system. And here's the way it works. For liquid collection, you slide your toes under here so that you don't float away. You hold this hose to the liquid uh, collecting part of your body and you dispense with your liquid. And then it is brought down that tube, sucked down that tube into a tank behind the wall here where it is reprocessed back into drinking water. Now the crew likes to say that's making tomorrow's coffee out of today's coffee. For solid collection, you open the lid. So this is the container that guy was playing the drums on. You open the lid here, you put in a bag, a single use bag, close the lid, and then you hold yourself down on that to deposit your solid waste in there. And then there are tissues and wipes that you can clean up. You close the lid of that bag and you put a new bag in there. And when this container is full of bags, you put the lid on that container and replace it with a new one and you wait for the cargo vehicle. So here's a little tour through the space station right now. This was shot about a year ago, so it looks pretty similar. You can see there are lots of experiments and equipment and stuff everywhere. So we're flying from one end to the other. There's a big window that goes down through there. All of these blue things are handrails so that you can use them to hold on. Big lenses for cameras, laptop computers, communication panel right here. Now we're going through one of those connecting parts that holds one module to the next module. Coming into the next section here, this is one of those node parts. So there is a module that goes in this direction, that direction, this direction, that direction, and all the way forward. We are the maintenance people on board the space station. So when it comes time to, to find out which wire has gone bad, that's our job and we have tools that allow us to do that. And each tool has its own little place to live and its own little piece of Velcro on it so it doesn't get lost. In fact, everything has a piece of Velcro on it, pens and pencils and scissors and wrenches and pieces of tape. And even your clothing has Velcro on it so that things can stick to you as you're working. All of our equipment and supplies comes up in these big white bags. And on board Space Station, there are a number of uh, experiments that can be run in glove boxes if you want to work with biological materials or chemicals or very small things, a freezer that will keep samples cold until we can return them to earth. This is the robotic workstation where she is operating the robotic arm. And the crew's been doing a number of plant experiments which are pretty interesting. It doesn't grow in soil, it grows in little media here in these, in these little pads. And in the absence of gravity, a plant is strong enough to hold up its own ball of water. And then we are the experiment. Understanding how the body performs in the absence of gravity is important that we 
that we know so that when we do longer explorations in space, longer than a year, we understand how the body performs. Spacewalking is also part of the task. These were the two women that actually did a spacewalk. And when we do the spacewalks, uh, now, again, he's got eight hours, she has eight hours of air and pressure in that suit, but it's all contained in the suit, no, no umbilical, but we do use a safety line to always connect to the space station. And because we knew people would be moving all around the outside of the space station during assembly and maintenance, these handrails are placed on the outside of all of the modules so that the crew can maneuver going all over the space station, all the way out to the end by going hand over hand. And you can see the safety lines that are still connected to structure. We can even put a crew member on the end of the robot arm and take that person over to a workstation so with feet restrained, you can now use your hands in order to do the job that you're doing. And if you come out of that foot restraint or your safety line breaks, the backpack that you're wearing has a little jet system in it that would allow you to fly back over to hold on to one of the handrails or to rescue your, your partner if needed be. So we've tested this, but we've never really had to use it. And of course, everybody takes a selfie. Here he's in a spacewalk taking a selfie and that's the camera lens right there the camera is wearing its own little spacesuit. This part of the space station is great. It's got seven big windows in it. So when you go inside, it's, it's a whole, it's a cupola. It's a whole windows of uh, what you can see outside. So of course, it's a great place to observe the Earth and a great place to take a selfie. And here's what the Earth looks like from our 400 kilometer orbit in space. So we do not see the whole Earth like you did from that first picture that I showed you. This is the section of the Earth that you see. And some parts of it are really extraordinary. This is a glacier in Alaska. These are ice flows off of Kamchatka. This is the waters off of Oman. This is the Andes in Argentina. The Namibian desert on the west coast of Africa the Sahara Desert, the Australian Desert, which is always very red. So all of the deserts look different. They're all different colors. And of course, parts that are very recognizable, um, everybody shoots Italy. So Croatia, you're living right there next to the, the picture that everybody shoots, which is really great. Here is Italy and Croatia at night. When I show you these night pictures, You'll see here's the Earth, of course, and stars. And you'll see this glow, this line right across the top. We call that the air glow. What that means is that this here is the atmosphere. All of the air that we breathe is below this little eggshell line. That's it. So that's, that is what keeps us alive on this planet. So here is uh, Zagreb right here in a, a night shot. So here is actually a great shot of Croatia and it's got almost all of it in there. So I've identified the cities for you. And then closer up, here is Zagreb. And a closer picture. Here is Zadar. And Split. And Dubrovnik, which was off the map before, but here's the picture of it. And since we have other people joining us, Oslo, I'm sorry, this is as close as I could get to you right here because you're really far north. This is Lisbon, Kiev, Budapest, Istanbul, people shoot Istanbul all the time. So there it is during the day. And here it is at night. North is not always up in these pictures, so I apologize. Paris. Paris at night. Bucharest, I'm sorry, I couldn't find the picture. I know I have it, but I didn't have time to find it. And of course, Bermuda. And we'll go around the world a little bit more. Here is Florida, another really recognizable part of uh, the world. Here is Florida at night. And here are the waters of the Caribbean off the coast of Florida here. There is no other body of water in the on the planet that looks quite like this. Here is New York, New York City Central Park right here. 
and New York at night. And again, here is Central Park. Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. at night. Tokyo Bay, I think, is the brightest city, uh, the most lights in all of the, the world. So I've included Tokyo here. And this one, I love this picture. This is Bangkok here. But all of these green lights are fishing boats in the South China Sea. This is the Himalayas and the Nile, Cairo and the Nile River Delta, and the Nile at night. Now, every astronaut from every country will tell you that as we go around the world and we make a complete orbit of the Earth every 90 minutes, and every astronaut will say the one thing that you do not see as you go around the world are borders that separate the countries. We are sort of disposed, predisposed to, to placing borders by the way we learn geography. You know, each country, each city, each state is a different color. It has lines around it. And you do not see those um, from space. Sadly, what you do see are the man-made borders. This is the lighted border here between India and Pakistan. This here is the island of Korea, which looks pretty normal. And here it is at night. This is South Korea. This is Pyongyang right here. So this is North Korea. Agriculture, this is in, these are man-made borders, but for a good reason. This is actually um, uh, near the Danube in Croatia near Osijek. So this is the way we sort of normally see agricultural lines, but in some parts of the world, it looks like this. This is in Brazil. These are called center pivot irrigation. So it irrigates a circular area. The green area is where crops are growing and the brown area is where it isn't. And these center pivot irrigation areas, again, green is where crops are growing and brown is where they are not, are in Saudi Arabia. And they are not using runoff water from mountains or, or snow. They are using fossil water from the center of the earth. And so when the water is used up, you have to move on to another area. And over the years, as we've, wa as we've watched these, there are now hundreds of them in Saudi Arabia. We also see the, effect, the, the footprint that we have put on our planet in not such a good way. I show you this, this is the Mississippi River, only just so you can see the shape of it, because here there's the Mississippi River and this dark part here was the BP oil spill reflected in the sun. This under smog is Beijing. All of the white lines here, the fuzzy stuff is clouds, but the sharp white lines, those are contrails from airplanes. These were all fires burning in the Amazon. And then we see nature's footprint on the planet. Um, this is a hurricane off the coast of, Cal of uh, Florida. This is what a thunderstorm looks like from above. And here's what lightning looks like. So all those flashing white lights, those, those are lightning flashes as seen from orbit. We, this is a speeded up video here, but that's what they look like. And here was the shadow from the eclipse that just happened a few weeks ago. We go around the Earth, I said, every 90 minutes. So for 45 minutes, we are in daylight. And for 45 minutes, we are in darkness. And that line between daylight and darkness, we call the terminator line. And so 16 times a day, we see the sunrise. And 16 times a day, we see the sunset. And because we are flying at a high in inclination, we, are, we have the opportunity to see the uh, northern and the southern lights, the aurora. So these are real pictures taken from space stations. Here's the solar array. And when you let your eyes adapt, when you let your camera see, then you can even see into the Milky Way galaxy. So that's the space station. Like I said, there has been somebody living on space station off and on, but there's always been a, a human presence on space station since the end of the year 2000. Recently, the uh, first American commercial uh, launch company sent their vehicle into space. This is the SpaceX and the Dragon. This is a real picture of the real launch and the real two guys that were in it. And here it is as it approaches the space station. This is a real picture. 
And here it is attached right now today to the International Space Station. And they will come home next month in that vehicle. And where we go from, from here, I don't know. Um, the moon is the next plan, but, but sort of the plans are up in the air about literally how we get back to the moon. But the moon is really a stepping stone because the really cool place to go would be Mars. This is a real picture taken from a satellite around Mars. And here's what's on Mars right now. This is that um, Curiosity rover. Um, and, and here's the size of those rovers, just to show you. This is the size of the Curiosity rover. This was the Spirit and Opportunity. This is the little Pathfinder. And this is at the Jet Propulsion Lab. They have a Mars surface that they can let these rovers roll around on to practice. But you can see these are normal sized guys. And it's not much bigger than a smart car. We also have a non-moving thing on Mars right now, the InSight, and it's the, this is the thing that drills holes into Mars. But you see they're not very big. But here are the pictures that they take from Mars, which I think are beautiful. But so all of those people that say, we're gonna go colonize Mars and we're gonna put 100 people on Mars, until we can figure out how to land something larger than a smart car on Mars, please don't buy your ticket for that flight. Mars is about as far as we can go with the technology that we have today. Until somebody invents a better propulsion technology, we won't be able to send human beings much beyond Mars. But we have sent satellites beyond Mars, and they have seen things like Jupiter or the moons of Jupiter, which could be interesting places to visit. Or Saturn, it's a real picture of Saturn. And if we were at Saturn and we were looking back at the Earth, that's what the Earth would look like, that blue dot. And then out of our solar system into our Milky Way galaxy and out of our galaxy into other galaxies. So these are pictures taken from the Hubble telescope of other galaxies. Of nebula where new stars are being born. This picture taken from the Hubble telescope covers a piece of sky covered by your thumb if you held it at arm's length. So just a tiny little piece of sky. And each one of those points of light in there is not a star. Each one of those is a galaxy. So imagine that. Billions and billions of galaxies, each having billions of stars with planets. I, I mean, you know, it's mind boggling. So when people say, why would we ever go to space? To me, I look at a picture like that and I say, why would we not? Thank you. All right, Marsha, thank you so much. I don't know about everyone else on the call, but those were some of the most interesting photos I think I've seen in my life and such a, a wonderful opportunity to see our planet from above. So thank you. And the photos of the water and the plants, it's really unbelievable. Um, I wanna share some questions that came in during that time, but I also just wanted to note, apparently 68% of you said that you would want to go to space, a little poll that we conducted while you were talking. Yep, yep. 26 said no, and I guess the others said they'd have to think about it, so. We may okay. have some, some future fair. astronauts. That's absolutely fair. Those are good numbers. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I also wanted to welcome some of our other visitors from, or our viewers from Chicago, Colorado, and Denmark. So we've really got a, a great international crowd here. All right, let's start out with a question from Gordana. Gordana says, how do you become an astronaut? What are the preparations and how long does it take to prepare? Well, I can only speak for American astronauts, but but from, for all astronauts internationally, everybody has a university education in some technical field, some STEM field, math, science, physics, geology, biology, you know, anything. So the first step for anybody in any country is that university degree with a science background or a STEM background. Um, in America, um, we apply to the program and the last time they put out an application, 18,000 people applied and they selected eight, I think. So it's, it's pretty tough to do. I actually applied three times before I was selected and that was back in 1984. Um, once you have been selected, then you go through a period of training um, that now takes, I think, two years that, that teaches you all about the NASA system, the International Space Station with all of its partners and there are 15 partners from all around the world. Um, and all of the contributions that they make and all of the science that goes into that. And so it takes a while to learn all of that. 
Space Station astronauts have to speak uh, English and technical Russian, regardless of, the, of their native language. Um, and so many astronauts come to us from all over the world speaking multiple languages, which is important. And then the other thing that is, that is looked for today is what they call expeditionary skills, your ability to work as a team, your ability to um, not get freaked out when you are put in an unusual situation to be able to think on your feet and work together as a team to sort through a, a problem that could be in potentially a very dangerous situation. So that, that's the kind of background that they, are, that they are looking for when they select. Great, thank you. And next we have a question from Natasha, uh, the question that might be on a bunch of our minds. What did you miss most from Earth when you were in space? Well, my space shuttle flights were very short. Um, the shortest was eight days, the longest was 14 days, you know, and I, I've actually been um, to Europe for longer than 14 days, you know, so there's not a lot that, that I could miss in 14 days. Uh, people that spend um, six months, it's interesting to hear them. They, of course, miss their families um, and their friends, although we do have a phone line on board, so you can call anybody in the world. You dial nine for an outside line, and you can call anybody in the world. And it's the, it's the universe's greatest phone because no one can, <laughs> you can only call out. <laughs> but it's interesting what the people on space station seem to miss is weather. You know, the feeling of sun on your face, the feeling of wind or rain, that kind of thing is something that, that is missed. I didn't really miss too much. <laughs> Just it depends where you're from if you miss the weather. <laughs> Great. Our next question is um, from Georgica, and she says, were you ever out in space outside the capsule, I guess a spacewalk, and what's the feeling when you levitate? Um, I didn't have the opportunity to do a spacewalk. Those spacesuits are many sizes fit most, but not me. Um, and so <laughs> the thing about that spacesuit is the, the top part of it is a hard torso. So it, it, it hits you at your shoulders, and then you attach an arm to it. And so you want your arm to articulate where the suit does, and I'm too narrow for that. So the first time I put that space suit on, they all started laughing and said, get out. <laughs> so unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to do it. But, if, but listening to people talk about doing a spacewalk, you know, we, as we are in space, we are literally falling, and we are falling at the speed that we are going around the Earth. So it, feel, it feels to us that we are weightless, you know, that we are floating. And then of course you can, as you've seen in the pictures, we can maneuver any which way. Um, so you don't actually feel like you are falling when you are inside. But when they go outside and, and now there's nothing around them, you know, except for the visor um, around their face, they do feel like they're falling. And they know that's crazy because it's no different than being inside, but it's, it's one of those moments. Um, and you hear people go out for the first time going, oh, wow, this is so cool. <laughs> You're really excited until they have to focus on what they're doing. So oh. it's something that everybody loves. That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, another question from Gordana, or maybe a different Gordana. She says, what kinds of experiments are conducted in space? I think referring maybe to the photo of the, the guy giving blood. Uh, the, well, the biological experiments, you want to see how your body actually changes. And so they do, um, you know, they take your blood before you go to flight, and then they take the blood in flight, and then take the, bring that home and blood when you come back, and compare it to see if there are any differences. And so they found some differences in um, genetic, not genetic things, but, but microbiological kinds of things that I am not the expert in, but that's what they look at. They do a number of experiments on vision, because we've had a number of astronauts who have had some vision problems that are not corrected when they come back to Earth. From the scientific experiments, they, they do a lot of material um, and chemical experiments. When you do experiments on the ground, gravity induces some effects that you, that you can't get around, like sedimentation, you know, heavier things sift to the bottom. Um, when there is no gravity, that doesn't happen. So you can look at the way materials melt and recombine without gravity induced forces and you can understand that um, that mechanism now at a more molecular level and if you can do that then on earth you can build a better process in order to make a better or stronger uh, material or a better drug if you can understand the way it interacts with it you know at a, at a molecular level so that's the kind of experiments they do cool thank you uh, sierra asks how often do you exercise in space 
So on the space shuttle, we exercised about 30 minutes a day and it was optional because the flights were short. On space station, they, it is not optional and they exercise two hours every day. Some combination of aerobic with that uh, bicycle ergometer or the treadmill and resistive with that, that strange crunching machine. Um, but two hours every day. And, and we have guys that are coming back from space in better shape than when they left. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, we have a question from Zorin. He says, is it possible to cultivate plants at the International Space Station with limited oxygen? Well, there isn't limited oxygen. I mean, because we are the plant that needs the oxygen the most. And so we are living in an oxygen nitrogen environment, just like you are at home. It's a sea level pressure. And so we're breathing the same sort of oxygen mix that you breathe here. Um, and so do the plants. So the study of plant growth in, in zero gravity is just that. How does a plant grow in zero gravity? So if you think about the way a plant grows in gravity, it's got to build a trunk system that allows it to hold up the leaves and the branches. If you think of a very big tree, think of it like an elephant. You know, an elephant has really big bones to hold up all of that elephant mass. And a tree has a big trunk to hold up all the mass of its branches and its leaves. But without any gravity, it doesn't have to lay down, it doesn't have to waste time building that kind of a structure. It can put more energy into the leaf or the root or whatever it is that, that gets its nutrition. So we feed the plants with, uh, with water and whatever the nutrient solution is that they're living in and they grow. Great, things can survive. And then we have a question from Gorin asking your opinion about the future of NASA's Artemis program, especially considering the, sp the prices of private space companies such as SpaceX. I know you talked a little bit about SpaceX. Well, that's, that's kind of a loaded, difficult question. Artemis, <laughs> for people that don't know, is the uh, lunar, the moon lander program that the United States has. And they've just contracted with three commercial companies to develop concepts for that vehicle that would, that would land on the moon. And that's not the one that takes you from Earth, it's the one that takes you from the vehicle that took you from Earth. You know, so we will send a crew to orbit the moon and now these companies will build a vehicle that connects to that and takes the crew to the, to the moon. <clears throat> the commercial companies, you know, people think that commercial space flight is, is sort of the save all of of spaceflight and, and remember that the commercial companies are getting probably 85% of their money from the government. It is the NASA budget that is paying those commercial development costs, not the commercial people. You know, they are paying it a small part of, a part of it, but they're not funding it completely. And a commercial company can only afford to build the things that closes their business case. So they can only build what they can afford to fly and then make a profit on. So my personal feeling is that unless there is significant oversight and attention paid to the way they build and develop and test their hardware, that we are putting people who fly on them at risk <clears throat> until we fully understand the capabilities um, and the risk we're taking. Thank you. I have a question I'd like to interject. So what advice would you give to young people, whether it's Croatia or Denmark or any of our other viewers tuning in who might want to pursue a career in space exploration? What are the well, things like that I, they should focus on in school now? Right. Well, like I said, the, uh, the focus is on a STEM, the science, technology, engineering, math um, kind of fields. And so my recommendation would be, which I tell everybody, study something that you enjoy. And if STEM is not your thing, then STEM is not your thing. But if it is, then pick an area there that you, that you like, because the ability to go into space is very rare today. Um, and you might not get that, but there are thousands of jobs in the space industry, whether it's with a contractor or whether it's with one of the government space agencies all over the world, um, that allow you to participate in that and to support that. Um, and you still need that STEM background. So whether you like the computer end of it or whether you like the, the optical end of it in, in building instruments, uh, whether you like the planetary end of it in exploring, whether you like the geological, and you know, people are gonna need geologists when they get to other planets eventually. And if they're young kids out there, you know, your day will come when, when you get the, to be the one on Mars saying, oh, look at this rock, you know, this is interesting. <laughs> 
you know, or on Europa or someplace like that. I mean, how cool would that be? But until you have the background in those fields, um, there's not much you can do about it. So start there. Thank you. Solid advice. Uh, a question from Petter. Have you ever had any sighting of a UFO? <laughs> um, I would tell you, truthfully, I would tell you if I had seen one, and I have not <laughs> seen any UFOs. Um, I think in the early days, uh, astronauts thought maybe they saw things that, that, that they couldn't explain, and a lot of that is uh, little bits that come off the spacecraft like ice, you know, because our propellants are, are very cold, cryogenically cold. Um, they form ice like at the end of the engine nozzle. And those pieces of ice break off and they reflect in the sun and you see a little bright thing that goes by and you say, oh, well, what was that? But almost all of that can be explained. I have never been on a flight or seen anything that I could not explain. So sorry to disappoint. <laughs> no problem. All right. And that Lily asks, how does it feel to take off from Earth, the sensation? You oh. described the feeling others describe in the spacewalk, but the launch, how was that? Yeah. Okay. So you're sitting on your back. So your, your eyeballs are pointing up and the rocket engine is underneath of you. And when it lights, um, on the shuttle we flew with the three main engines and the solid rocket motors at the same time. Solid rocket motors run very rough. So it shakes and it rattles and it rolls and your eyeballs roll around in your eyes. And, you know, and you're pressed back into your seat with, with twice your weight. So it feels like another of you is sitting on your chest which is not too bad because you, you can still, you know, it's not the of your face. It's just sort of pressure on your chest. And then after two minutes, those solid rocket motors come off and then it's just as smooth as like electric drive. So the guys that launch on the Soyuz get that same sort of feeling. It's very smooth uh, engines, electric engine or um, liquid engines. Now, as we get higher um, in the orbit, uh, in the atmosphere rather, and we've burned off more of the propellant, we can accelerate a little bit more. And so on the space shuttle, we accelerated up to three times our weight. On the Soyuz, they go to four. And what that means is there are now four of you sitting on your chest, sort of like a gorilla sitting on your chest. And if you think about that, um, it's really easy to exhale because a gorilla pushes all the air out of you. And it's really hard to inhale. Because now when you inhale, you have to push the gorilla back off your chest in order to take a deep breath. Um, and that lasts for about a minute, a minute and a half. And then when the engine's cut off, immediately you are weightless. I mean, in a split second, it's gone and you are weightless. And everything floats. Oh and gosh. that floats, takes about nine minutes. And how do you prepare yourself for that, for the, the minute? You don't prepare yourself for that. <laughs> you listen to people talking about it. Um, in, the, in the later years, I didn't get the centrifuge flight, but they would put astronauts in a centrifuge and spin them so that they could feel the 4Gs. Um, but you don't feel the vibrations, you don't feel, I mean, there's something psychological about knowing you have been sitting on 7 million pounds of explosive rocket fuel and you are leaving the planet. You know, you don't get that in a centrifuge. And it, it, it works on your mind in a way that cannot be explained and it cannot be trained. Now, the second time you do it, now the feelings are, are familiar and they're comfortable and you go, oh yeah, I remember that. And, yeah, that's <laughs> and oh, this space shuttle flies a little differently than that one, but that's a normal feeling. You know, and the new guy is looking at you going, is that a good sound? Is that a good feeling? <laughs> and, you know, that, that, it's cool. That's awesome. Thank you. I think we have time for like two more questions. So we've had a few come in, but one thing I just wanted to touch on, we've seen a few comments saying that like apparently the flat earth theory has seen a bit of a resurgence lately. What would you say to people who, who would talk about flat earth? You know, I want to ask the flat earth people, what happens at the edge? <laughs> you know, where's the edge and what happens at the edge? Do you just like go around it? I mean, I don't get it. But I can, I can tell you, I have been around the earth, you know, thousand some times, and it's not flat. <laughs> All right, excellent. And uh, just one more question for you. So being in space, you obviously you prepare yourself for it mentally, physically as much as possible, but there's still gotta be moments when you have to really draw on your own internal resilience to be up there and in a small space and away from familiarity. What, what are some words of wisdom you could give viewers in this time that really requires us all to be a little more resilient than normal? One of the things you learn, particularly living, I mean, the space shuttle is, was a very small volume. 
And so you are never not near somebody. You know, it's sort of like being in a small minivan with the door locked from the outside, thrown into a hazardous environment. So there you are. <laughs> what you learn, which is not something that we are that we are taught in Western cultures, and that is that privacy is something you give somebody. You don't necessarily create privacy by surrounding yourselves by walls, but it is a respect that you show somebody for staying out of their space, whether it is their physical or their emotional or their, their personal space. It's a respect kind of thing. And you have to learn that um, because to give it, you get it. Um, and that's, that's probably the most useful lesson from being in space that we can apply to, to today when we are uh, isolated in a way um, and many people locked in the house, you know, for the most part with, with their own family members or other people is that privacy is, is a respect thing and it's something you give somebody. So do that. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to all of our viewers. If you have any questions after this session for Marsha, feel free to email them or post them on Facebook and we will pass them along. But Marsha, thank you so much for your time. and My pleasure. Sharing. Thank you for everybody that joined. If I had known, you know, Chicago, Denver, I have pictures of you. <laughs> you those too. Well, we'll look forward to another time in the future when we can bring you back to Croatia in person and we'll get all the pictures up there. I look so in the meantime, to. yeah, thank you all so much and please stay in touch and uh, have a good day. Bye everybody. <laughs>